at AIA Australia, helping your clients in their time of need is our number one priority. In 2016, we paid over $1.15 billion in claims to both retail and group members. That's over $4.5 million every working day. To offer your clients cover you can trust, chat to your AIA CDM today. Hey everybody, Ray Dramas from XY Advisor here. Uh, as always, really excited to be presenting this week's XY Live podcast. Uh, very fortunate to be joined. Sorry, a little bit of technical issues there. My apologies, guys. Um, so yeah, really excited to be working with with Thea of uh, 9099 Content. I've, I've been working with uh, Thea and uh, David in the business, uh, primarily around doing um, not quite press releases, but certainly uh, qu quotes for content uh, for a couple of institutions. And uh, one of the things that I've really enjoyed working with the guys is their um, kind of enlightened way of, of, of speaking to the industry. It's certainly not consistent with what I've seen <laughs> in, in the main, mainstream. So uh, I think it will really resonate with, with all of the XY advisor community. Um, you know, I, I know it's, it, social media, we all understand it's important and content and those sorts of things, but what an absolute minefield um, if you're not sort of uh, across the, the little tricks and tips. Uh, so with that, Thea, I might ask if you'd be kind enough to introduce yourself to the guys. Absolutely. Well, I started my career as a journalist before eventually making my way to content marketing. Um, and would you believe my very first television interview was with Chopper Reed. Um, <laughs> so that was a bit of a baptism by fire. Um, since then, that was win local news back in Bundaberg. Uh, made my way sort of up the journalism ladder, uh, working for ABC, SBS, uh, ending in Canberra, covering uh, three of Australia's greatest politicians within the space of three years, um, and then pulled the pin on that, and I've been doing uh, content marketing with uh, a lot of the big banks um, and uh, industry bodies since then. Awesome. It's a, you, you say you sort of climbed up the ladder from shopper to politicians. I could argue it's gone the other way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, listen... Awesome. Got kind of forty-five minutes to an hour. Let's 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 kind of get straight into it. Um, content me, uh, you know, content marketing and financial services. I'm quite keen on uh, you know your views on how that differs from from other industries. I think actually financial services is doing content marketing really well. Um, from having worked in other sectors, um, sort of tech, universities, um, I think financial services has really um, embraced this and is doing it well. And I think perhaps one of the reasons is that um, often you only see clients a couple of times a year. Um, and so the industry has recognised content marketing as a really great way of, of getting in touch, uh, providing value between meetings um, and also just reminding people that you still exist. Um, and in terms of... Um, the value of the content. I think particularly in financial services, there is a real opportunity to provide genuine value. Um, I think financial literacy in this country isn't necessarily great and people may be um, afraid or embarrassed to ask questions. So if you can be educating them through your content marketing at the same time as reminding them that you exist, I think that's a huge win-win and I think the industry is, is really um, embracing that. Yeah, you, you kind of took the words out of my mouth with the, the financial literacy thing. Um, you know, as, as the industry kind of moves towards the, the general advice, scaled advice, um, you know, we've even seen things like Nod where you can sort of pay 20 to 50 bucks to get a, a short answer to, to one question. Um, you know, my, my sense is the, the benefit of, the, you know, being really strong with your content is you're just providing really helpful information that then becomes kind of a, a, a lead gen, for want of a better word, into more comprehensive advice. Absolutely, yeah. To, to that end, what, what are some of the major things advisors are, are tripping over on at the moment when they're, when they're sort of having a go at this stuff and kind of, you know, muddling their way through a blog and, you know, pulling their face, their, their iPhones out and doing you know, videos and stuff? What, what, what are they tripping over? Um, so it's content marketing, but I think um, you've really got to start with good quality content. Um, otherwise, you know, you can pop up your Facebook, you boost your, all of your, your posts, but um, if it's rubbish content, then it's kind of like putting lipstick on a pig. Um, so uh, I think 
frankly, a lot of the, the text is quite sterile and safe. Um, and people have short attention spans anyway these days. So you've really only got a couple of paragraphs to draw people in. And after that, you've lost them forever. So I think instead of writing like an 800 word sort of masterpiece that all your peers are going to look at and go, oh, yes, he's very intelligent. Um, I think concentrate on your readers. Uh, draw them in with a really strong hook or lead. Um, and so that's just for an idea of, of what makes a good hook or lead. It's something that should shock, intrigue, surprise, um, maybe create a sense of urgency or offer a solution. Um, and so then once you've got them hooked, continue to use accessible language, I think. Don't throw a thesaurus at them or try and show how clever you really are or make it a chore for them to read. Um, if you look at the average newspaper article, it's written for eight to 12 year olds. And that sounds a bit crazy. Um, but when you read a, a newspaper, you don't feel condescended to. So I think keep that in mind. It's, it's not condescending. It's just clean, readable, accessible copy. Um, and the other major thing I think is, is uh, presentation. Um, even if the, the words are good, if you see like a wall of text or a crappy stock image, that's a, a pretty quick turn off. Um, so take, for example, like the SMH online or news.com, um, you'll see the way that they set out the text is every sentence is a paragraph in and of itself. And you can't scroll down more than an entire page without seeing a little subheader. So that kind of thing that breaks up the text, it's not a wall of text and white space is really good in that sense. Um, in terms of the images, I think, Stock images, as I said, they look a bit crappy. Don't be afraid to use them though. Like you can really jazz them up. If you go on a free um, graphic design type platform like Canva or something, you can um, personalize them to the story. So put a, a hook over the top of the image um, in a clever way. Or I think think laterally. So um, say you've got a blog piece about tracking the success of your business against your competitors. Don't have a guy, like a photo of a guy sitting in his computer with his coffee looking like he's contemplating a bathroom break. Um, <laughs> what about like sprinters at the start of a, a race track about to take off? That's really dynamic, but it still fits the brief of tracking your performance against your competitors. Cool. Um, I, uh, with the Canva thing, I, I was going to suggest for the guys who have not heard of it before, absolutely jump on it. It's it's a real cool way of looking like you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. um, and, uh, with, with the stock photos, something that I'd come across that, again, might be of some interest for the guys is uh, a medium uh, uh, blog called Stock Photos That Don't Suck. Um, and it gives you about 10 different links to some really, really cool, cool, interesting things. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things that I guess advisors can kind of take in, into their business. Do you, do, uh, have you yeah. sort of seen any sort of low-hanging fruits or little cool tools that uh, advisors can, can sort of play with today? Um, look, I, I do think Canva is a good one. You can uh, make really original, end up with really original product. Um, you can also do sort of infographics from that, which is really a good way of explaining things. If you're doing an explainer, you can do a, a flow chart or whatever, and all of the tools are in there to make a, an infographic that looks really schmick. Okay, cool. Um, and with, with content, I know it, it's a bit tricky. The industry is in a bit of a transition phase uh, where we've, we've certainly got two schools of businesses uh, where you've got the traditional style of model where people are relying on referrals uh, with lawyers, estate agents and, and the like. And that, you know, that's, that's served uh, for, for quite a while for the industry. Um, and then you've got a lot of, uh, you know, the, the enlightened way of doing things, which is focused on social media, content marketing, having a, a presence online. You know, what's, what's your view on uh, how important it is to actually execute on a, on a uh, social media or content marketing plan? Um, I think there's obviously heaps of old school advisors out there doing a really roaring trade just with word of mouth. Um, but I think... It's, it's not an either or because the reality is if you do get a word of mouth referral, you're not going to pull out the yellow pages and look up the phone number. You're going to Google it. And when you Google it, the website's going to pop up and they've landed on your page. And so 
um, I think it is good to also have all of that uh, well promoted social stuff um, and, and fresh content on your website. So, um, you know, long before someone shakes your hand these days, they're going to check you out online. Um, and all the data says that it only takes a couple of seconds to make uh, an impression of a business. Um, and so if you've got like a fresh website, you've got engaging content and you've also got helpful content, I think you're really starting to build your trust and rapport and that's, that's going to marry really well with the word of mouth referral that you've got. The, the helpful um, content thing I think is quite cool, yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing is to remember with content marketing is that it's not just about lead generation, it definitely helps with that. But um, as I said, it, it's about sort of providing that ongoing value, um, educating people and reminding them that you still exist and, and, and that there, there is, um, yeah, that additional value. Okay. And is it, is, I mean, the blog, blog on a website is kind of the, 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 I guess, what people start to look at. But then, you know, there's a bit of a minefield with, um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. I know you kind of focus more on the content and what, you know, what you're actually writing. But do you have a view or... You know, a bit of guidance for people that are looking at all these different social media channels and, uh, you know, finding it somewhat, I guess, overwhelming? Yeah, I think um, there's not a one-size-fits-all and it's really good to sort of test. So something we talk about is doing A-B testing or split testing where you test the very same thing but slightly alter to the delivery. So um, you could test two different uh, e-newsletter headlines for the same piece of content and monitor which does better. Or you could do the same with posting on your Facebook versus um, LinkedIn. And there is so much data being collected. Like there's so much Google Analytics, Facebook Analytics. So use that information um, and, then, and then tailor your content accordingly. Does that then lend itself to the idea that it's okay to, you know, have a go and, uh, you know, trip, trip over a little bit in the real world? It, you know, you don't need to have this polished thing every time you, you, you put something out in the, the World Wide Web. For sure. I think just give it a go and you'll build up your confidence. You'll get to know what works and what doesn't. Okay. Yeah, because I did want to ask, I mean, advisors are... I guess traditionally quite analytical, um, you know, we're quite good at crunching numbers, doing, doing an analysis, understanding um, perhaps a quantitative type of, of the view, view of the world. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily lend itself to, uh, you know, being a creative writer. <laughs> um, you know, sort of think back to high school and, you know, the guys that were really strong at economics and mathematics perhaps weren't in the, the advanced English classes. Um, yeah. So, you know, what, what's your guide or do you have an, a view that, you know, for advisors that aren't just very good at writing? Yeah, I think actually it's really interesting. There's um, a guy called A.A. A. Gill. He passed away late last year, but he was um, a really famous food critic and writer, but he actually was, had severe dyslexia. And so he um, dictated all of his stories to copywriters. Um, now, I'm not saying that uh, necessarily if you're dyslexic, but if you're not a natural writer, um, I know that what advisors are is great communicators. You're great communicators. You day in, day out, you sit down in front of a person and you explain complicated things um, and, and, you know, you know when you're losing people. Um, so I think take that strength, that verbal communication strength, and what you can do is sit down maybe with a junior staff member with maybe five, 10 questions that um, will help fill out this content idea and talk them through, talk it out, and then get that tape sent off for transcription. It's like if you've got a 20 minute tape, 10 bucks on Fiverr or something like that. And then it comes back to you as something on paper because the scariest thing is looking at a blank piece of paper um, and then going around in circles about how do I put this in writing? Whereas if you've got something, you've already got it out, you've communicated it really well verbally, then it's just a matter of editing it down rather than starting with a blank piece of paper. Okay, cool. So that, that uh, so literally, you know, have a chat with someone in the office, record it, um, maybe think about, I did a, a podcast yesterday on, on whether or not it's a good idea to lend kids to lend kids money. <laughs> um, so... 
<laughs> yeah, don't do it. <laughs> um, but so I guess, you know, if, if you're not strong at writing, it's okay then just to record that, um, get it transcribed, and then you've got something to, to start with. Yeah, you've definitely got a really solid starting point that way. All right. And I, you know, that kind of then would lead me to believe then that tone is probably quite important. Um, Again, when we're writing uh, as advisors, quite often, you know, relatively formal in emails, but certainly in our advice documents, they're not colloquial. <laughs> um, so is there kind of a different view that uh, with content marketing, you're kind of having a chat on paper? Yeah. Um, and particularly because uh, a lot of the topics, not all, but a lot of the topics will be things that have been done a million times before that someone can look up on moneysmart.gov.au. So you don't want to replicate that. You want to sort of um, be able to cut through and demonstrate your personality. So I think a really good way of doing it is, as I said, picture your sort of um, typical client and or just you're at a barbecue with a drink in hand having a chat. So you want to be... Um, you want to be really quite accessible. And, and I just, I do think, uh, I can't stress how much, how important it is to really show your personality. Um, often what happens when I interview people is I'll get a cracking one liner and then, um, I'll give it back to them to proof the copy and okay it. And it sort of it gets really watered down. It becomes, so an example is, um, I spoke to someone the other day about an abandoned mine site that was leaching a heap of really nasty stuff into the local river, right? And the interview, interviewee um, described it as, I think it was a jewel in the crown of pains in the ass for the government. It was a great, that. like that's really going to make the copy sing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I get it back and he's said, he's made the quote, uh, it was a real problem for the government. So... You know what I mean? Like you can go from something that's really going to sing um, to something that's a nothing. So I think, yeah, don't be afraid to, that's an extreme example. Obviously I can see why he would not want to say that about the government necessarily, but um, you know, inject your personality because um, that's what's going to make the blog stand out from every other piece under the sun about superannuation. And with, with that, you know, being colloquial, do you have a, a sense of, or a view rather on on uh, swearing. <laughs> um, you know, some of the some of the bigger blogs that I follow in financial services, one of which is the Reformed Broker, a, a New York stock broker that's uh, sort of out there changing the the the, the wrongs of, of yesteryear. Um, and he just goes nuts. Um, but it's it's quite polarizing. You know, what what do you have a view on that? I think keep it in line with your personality. You don't you know you don't want to necessarily put anything out there that you wouldn't say um and again that comes down to personality i think it's best to be colorful without being crass or necessarily using there's, there's plenty of other ways that you can express that outrage or whatever it is and much better ways you know we've got some great um turns of phrase in australia that you can really employ to say it was you know bloody shit there's plenty of other ways to kind of express that without swearing yeah fair enough and you also mentioned the Money Smart website, which I actually reckon is quite cool for financial literacy. I, I quite like it. What what then is your view on, you know, if I'm writing a blog about something and, and you know, Money Smart just covers a lot of the stuff quite well and it's, you know, it's, it's in simple language about linking linking a whole bunch of different references and sources in, in my own blog. Is that is that kind of a good thing? For sure. And that's smart content creation because you don't you don't want to reinvent the wheel if it's out there it's good quality and it's unbiased or whatever use it i think um just put a, a good headline on it or a good intro on it so don't say oh you know i've been thinking about this and i think you should read about this make it really engaging tell them why they want to hear it so like you know don't start off with maybe uh the reserve bank is looking to in indicated it's going to increase rates you'd say um do you have an extra do you have a spare 200 bucks in your pocket each month because you're going to need it and then you go into because that's what the rate interest increase is going to mean so just yeah try and put a new spin on it but yeah you can certainly repurpose stuff 
Makes sense. And uh, is it true? Does Google like that stuff? So you know, if you're trying to get yourself in a good position for searches and stuff, it, it, I I don't know very much about the on the online search engines and the SEO and all that stuff. But I imagine if you're linking and uh, and sort of creating a, a hub of stuff, does that is that a good thing to do? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why you'll see like. Um, you know, even news websites are doing it now. They're linking to their competitor stuff because they know it boosts it all. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, all right, cool. Now, if if you are, you know, you're finding your way through the the publishing world and and you, you're kind of uh, writing blogs and it's kind of working and you have found your tone and that that's all good. Um, you've you've obviously got your own channels, um, but you know, one of the things that I really uh, it scared me when I was when I was starting out was uh, the idea of getting my content published elsewhere. Um, so you know, approaching the likes of the IFA, Money Management, or even Sydney Morning Herald, and kind of shakily saying, <laughs> "This is my view. Please read it." Um, you know, what, what's what's your kind of advice on 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 that? Because it's 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 nice, I guess, to to get to that point. Yeah. Um, look, I think you've just got to ask because. The reality is being personally on the other side of this um, is that journos um, and people in the trade publications, they're under the pump. They're often desperate for content. Um, and so just approach them and say, are you looking for contributors? And you can provide stuff that's going to fill a hole. They're also doing this with, you know, half the resources they had five years ago. So they'll jump on it. And the other thing is, um, be that person that they can go to at short notice. So, you know, if something pops up in the news, they need content, tell them I'm available for quick content. Um, and that way, not only are you getting your name out there, the journal is also, you know, got, um, uh, is feeling like they can come to you. They also kind of owe you a favor. So next time you do have a piece of content, you can push it on them. Um, and then the, the, the final thing with that is that it's really easy content. It makes your content generation job so much easier because when the journal writes up that story, all you've got to do is link it and your work's done. And also it's just got that extra level of authority because someone else is publishing it. Mm, gets written for you. <laughs> uh, one, one awesome piece of advice I got uh, was um, if you are looking at a publication that you're trying to get into, uh, just ask the journalist what issues they're looking at um, mm -hmm. and kind of help them. Uh, you know, it, 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 if you're sort of on the outside of the industry, you can kind of get this sense that publications are this trap door and they're looking at the industry and they're judging and it's, it's, it's like a one-way type. But it's, it's, my experience is that that's not the case at all. Journalists no. need us as much as we need them. <laughs> yeah. And that's why, you know, you see certain publications and they just have the same people talking all the time because they're reliable and they know that they can get them. So they're probably looking to expand that pool. Put your hand up. Yeah, cool. Um, all right. So uh, what, what are some simple ideas that advisors can use uh, to kind of spice or jazz up their, their content? Um, you know, is it, I, I quite like personally I like the, the so, you know, top five ways to save money on you know school holiday or whatever you know but what, what other stuff is it yeah listicles are great um just because uh with that whole attention span thing yeah just giving someone something that's easy to skim through they get what they can out of it in the time that they have um your q and a's are also another good just vary the format as much as possible um and and keep um keep it fresh i think um, invite people from who aren't necessarily competitors but can add value to your clients. So they might be from a complimentary service and you can uh, bring in their advice and it, it makes you look good. Okay. Um, do you have a view on advisors interviewing clients for content? So I work in a business where you know, average clients are a little older and uh, some have really interesting careers that are, that are outside of financial services. Um, and they're just kind of cool people to talk to. And I've, I've, I've often thought it might be a bit of an idea just to get them on camera and just shoot the breeze, really. And, you know, it's got nothing to do with financial services, but it's just interesting stuff. Um, yeah. I've, got, I've got access to that, but I don't, like, no one else, none of my competitors do. So, yeah, you know, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's great. I think um, being a storyteller is, is a really good asset. So if you can 
and if you can tap into that resource that you have, as you say, no one else has, um, and turn that into something that demonstrates the rapport that you have with someone. Um, and, you know, you'll, you'll chuck in the odd question that kind of bigs you up and says, you know, um, because of your assistance, you know, you got this, but you, you definitely don't want to make that um, the, the point of the, of the interview or the central um, issue. It's just a bit of an aside. Yeah, the, the real thing is the storytelling. Okay, and it's okay that it's got nothing to do with financial services? Look, I think, it, it, again, it depends on you and your brand, but I think that says a lot about the rapport that you have um, and the kind of business that you do and the long-term relationship. So I think that definitely adds value to your, your value proposition as an advisor. Cool. Um, sort of just thinking through with, with all these things, they, they take time, right? Um, and I, don't, I, I wonder if sometimes advisors think that it's an extra on top of their core role, which is really, you know, providing advice, speaking to prospects, uh, centres of influence. And, you know, this, is, this, is a, 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 this gets layered on, on top. Um, you know, I'm sure you talk to a lot of advisors. You know, what, what sort of time are they dedicating uh, to, to content marketing? It can be nothing up to, you know, having someone who does a day a week uh, marketing or, or more. Um, again, it's to do with the traction you're getting, but I think it's important um, to give things time. Um, sometimes people will do a blog every now and then and then kind of just get a bit jaded, you know, it's only getting a few clicks. I think it's really important to be consistent um, because otherwise, you know, people aren't going to be looking out for it. It's, it's not going to get that sort of uh, momentum. Um, so do what you can. Um, and the other thing is to work with someone. Um, I think, you know, every, pretty much everything that you see professionally published has gone through two or three different eyes. So it doesn't have to be so much time out of your week. It might get passed around a little bit. Um, and the other thing is... Um, if it's not your strength, outsource it. There are so many content marketing um, agencies out there um, that do this kind of thing, us included, disclaimer. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you, you can, there are definitely resources to do this smartly um, and, and it doesn't have to be a chore. And again, that's kind of when you talk about doing that content planning, um, it just becomes a part of your week where you've already done the brainstorming and the hard stuff. Um, it might just then be a matter of sitting down with your tape recorder and, and getting something down quickly. You know, that I takes a 15 minute conversation with someone, it comes back and then you can just edit it down. That, that can get the task down for an original piece of content that you yourself have created, can cut down the time tremendously. I, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that's great advice. And plus, I, I, I imagine we talk much quicker than we type anyway, right? So I love the idea of just talking into a thing and, you know, send me five blogs. <laughs> it's a really good way of doing it, I think. I like the idea of the consistency thing. Um, and I think back to, you know, my podcast that I listen to and, uh, you know, it, one, I'm sort of a big football fan and it comes out every Wednesday night and if it doesn't come out on the Wednesday night, I start getting pretty upset about it and I don't owe them, they don't owe me anything, but I, you know, I, I, I start to expect that. Um, so I'd be keen on, you know, on consistency. So, you know, every day, every week, every month, what, what kind of works best? Oh, look, I think, again, what you can do consistently, there's no point putting okay. things out you know, three times a week and then having a three month, four month break. So keep it doable um, and, and craft your content with that in mind. So, you know, it might be one original piece a month that you get time to write and then um, a little bit of outsourced content that you've bought um, that you can personalise or, or publish as is and then maybe some sort of reposting, sharing, that sort of thing. So just from the start, work out what you can commit um, and then be consistent because it looks, it doesn't look great if you land on a website and, you know, there's been a heap of content and then nothing for six months to a year. Are they out of business? Have they gone on holiday? Like what's going on there? Yeah, I, uh, I, I came across a website and it had heaps of heaps of um, content, which I thought was quite interesting. I started crawling through it and it was kind of monthly up until maybe June 2016 and nothing since. 
and it's just a yeah. desert. I'm like, Whoa. like, I wonder if it's better just not to have anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, keep it consistent and um, and just be prepared to to give it some time and look at those analytics. They're really, really useful. It can help you uh, prioritise the time that you do spend. Um, oh, that makes great sense. We, we've got a couple of questions towards the end about um, how to stand out, which I'd be keen on, on understanding, but something that just came to mind, I'd love, love your thoughts on how advisors should respond to big financial events. So, um, you know, one of the things that come to mind for me is the federal budget. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as the budget comes out, the next day, me and everybody else in the industry are running around blogging, uh, doing videos, uh, and I, I wonder, I wonder if you're just adding to noise at times, or if it's okay for me just to be talking to my clients, and that's that's the purpose of it, uh, versus you know trying to attract new new leads. Do you have, do you have a view on on that? Yeah, I think there is there is so much out there after the budget. Um, I do still think that there is a role for advisors to sort of play as a, as a trusted um, spokesperson who can sort of cut through. So I think uh, probably just keep it, keep it simple. So, you know, my top five takeaways from the budget are this, this, this and this, and then have um, sort of a case study or an example of what that actually means. Don't, um, you know, have legislation has been introduced to reduce, you know, to blah, 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 then the name of the act or, you know, they're planning to introduce that. Um, say, this is what it's going to mean. It's going to mean that, uh, you know, when you fuel up your car, it's going to cost you X amount more each week. That adds up to this over a year or, you know, just make it real, make it cut through all of that jargon. And then once you've done your top five or whatever, link to good articles. It's that, that whole thing, don't reinvent the wheel. Just find what you, you know, and then it could be Ray's top, five explainers to get your head around the budget. You know, if you only read five articles, read these. I think one of the, the main themes uh, that you've kind of been talking about today is making sure your personality is coming out, um, yeah. which, which makes sense, right? Um, is that, are you sort of finding that that's how advisors are um, making their content or their copy stand out from, from the others? Or is there other stuff that, that, that they can kind of do? Um, I think that's probably one of the easiest things to do. And yep. so I think that's a good go-to. Um, and again, it provides that sort of continuity of service in between your appointments. Um, and it, it doesn't, I mean, yes, personality is really great, but just being personable, being, um, making it accessible to people. Okay, yeah, it makes, makes great sense. Um, and then I guess finally, you know, there's a lot of content marketing um, which involves writing articles. What are some writing tips i guess um you know we like we like practical stuff that people can just take away so we've got canva um you know the the stock photos don't suck <laughs> which i encourage you all to check out uh what yeah, what are yeah. some some other kind of key things that you'd, you'd encourage everyone to, to take away from today yeah i think um it's it's kind of the stuff that we've been going over it's making it personable making it accessible um not talking down to people, but definitely talking in a way that you'd have a chat to your mate at the barbie or whatever. Um, and don't be precious with your writing as well. I think that's, um, that's really important. Get it on paper. Often I'll write a piece and it'll be, I don't know, double the word expected word count or something. So a good idea is to get it down on paper, um, walk away from it for half a day and come back with fresh eyes, sit with it over a cup of coffee. And if there's, anything in it that doesn't directly uh, serve the purpose of the blog, cut it. You, you don't want it to be over 500 words. Um, to be honest, you'll be lucky if people get that far. Um, so, you know, keep, keep good stuff at the top. Um, you know, you, you still want your call to action at the, at the bottom, but, um, but yeah, definitely just cut the fat as much as you can. And that's where it's really good to have someone else to cast their eyes over it. Preferably someone who, you know, isn't in the know, who is maybe approaching this a little bit green. And then yeah. they can give you a really good view on how accessible that is for your average client. And I suppose adding to that as well is uh, uh, asking journalists what they're, 
what they need help with. You know, it's it's kind of an interesting. It's so simple. The best ideas are often so simple, but uh, just to ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I think another thing, another important thing is um, make sure there's enough meat in the article. It's a really fine balance between giving someone some real value so that they get to the end of the article and they think, oh, yeah, I've learned something. Um, but, you know, um, you don't want to do yourself out of a job, obviously, and, and, and you're not going to buy anything you put on paper. So be prepared to, be, to share. Be generous with what you do. Put in these articles because... They're going to come to you anyway as the expert to implement it, but you're you're not just teasing them with a cute you know headline or whatever. You're actually giving them value. I have have learnt that you know people, and I think the XY advisor community is quite different. People are sharing all their IP. It's, it's really lovely, but I think you know you don't necessarily need to do that in a in a way that you get concerned. I think I think especially with clients, you can really show them your rationale and what you're considering and the tools that you're using. Um, and people will still come and, and have a chat to you anyway because, uh, you know, it's the whole thing of you could probably get a tax return done yourself, but uh, having a professional sat over and just making sure that you're not doing yourself a disservice gives you that cool. surety, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and you, if you are thinking, for example, of doing your tax return yourself, you know, you read everything that's involved and you think, okay, I've made an informed decision. I am actually going to get someone else to do it. Yeah, makes makes wonderful sense. Uh, look, there, um, there is in the, the Facebook group, as is uh, David, uh, her, her business partner. So if, if you've got questions after today, um, I'd encourage you just to, to spam the, the Facebook group, uh, ask away. The guys are really generous with their time, so I'm sure they'd uh, both be very happy to, to help and, and answer any questions that, that you have. But, yeah, thanks so much for your time it's not uh it's not often we get uh, access to someone with a resume such as yourself <laughs> um and applying that to financial really i'm sorry i think chopper really made it stand out <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely look thanks thanks the i Re really appreciate it and uh i'm, I'm sure you'll get a, a few questions on the on the page soon great thank you for having me Thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, just before we wrap up, um, I do want to thank uh, AIA. They're our uh, partners for the podcast this year um, and, and they help and, and make this uh, possible. So uh, a big thank you to, to the guys down at AIA. Thank you and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.